I want to, I get to introduce and look forward to introducing our, our first speaker. Bill Hazenkamp has been a good friend of the River District and of this seminar. He's been a past speaker and a proven partner for the Upper Basin and for the other states uh, on interstate solutions to the Colorado River. Bill is the manager of, Col of Colorado Water Resources for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, where he develops and manages water supply programs to augment Metropolitan's Colorado River supplies. Bill has been with Metropolitan since 2001. During that time, he's negotiated transfer agreements with irrigation districts, exchange agreements with other municipal agencies, and funded new water supply projects, which have more than doubled Metropolitan's Colorado River water supplies. Please join me in welcoming Bill Hazenkamp from California, who has raced in last night, is racing back right after his presentation in order to join a double century bicycle race in California. Bill, thanks for coming. Thanks for that introduction. It's great to be in Grand Junction. Oops. Uh, I went for a run this morning and really enjoyed the cool, crisp air. It's been a really hot summer in Southern California. Uh, I live in Manhattan Beach. That's a picture of my hometown there. Uh, I think Manhattan Beach is about as far away as you can get from Grand Junction uh, on the river. But the Colorado River is just as important to this beach volleyball community as it is to the city of Grand Junction up here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good time of year to, to be in LA and to be a sports fan. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the baseball season and the Dodgers, maybe this is their year. We've been waiting a long time, so we're excited about the possibility of the Dodgers going all the way. And I noticed on Monday that the Broncos beat the LA Chargers. And I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about, about it. The LA Chargers, I grew up not liking the Chargers. In fact, I grew up rooting against the Chargers and now they're in my backyard just a few miles from where I live. And I'm, I'm kind of conflicted about how I'm supposed to feel. I think it would be like Eric Kuhn when he retires going to work for IID. I think that's, that's kind of what the Chargers coming to LA is like. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a, a, a big week for my agency. This week we approved uh, the agreements that implement Minute 323, which the International Boundary Wa and Water Commission is poised to sign later this month. And we also added $2 million to this system conservation agreement with our partners in Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado, and the Bureau of Reclamation to do one more year extension of system conservation in both upper basin and lower basin. Uh, so I am from the lower basin, and sometimes uh, when I hear how the lower basin, in quotes, is, is uh, Eric's uh, talk, for example, we're watching the lower basin, but the lower basin is about as different as you can get. Uh, each state is very unique. Uh, we have two agencies suing us at Metropolitan in the lower basin. Arizona is under a power struggle about who controls their Colorado River water. And there's not really a common uh, understanding about what to do with the Salton Sea. Uh, oftentimes I find myself more uh, philo philosophically aligned with Western Colorado than I do with Arizona. So the lower basin is not a unique entity at all. We're very different. So I'm not speaking from the lower basin today. I'm going to speak from uh, my agency, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And we are a relatively small agency uh, area-wise uh, in Southern California. However, we have 19 million people in our service area. So in that little strip of land that's about 150 miles long and 60 miles wide, we have more people than all of the rest of the Colorado Basin combined. Uh, about 1 in 17 people in the United States live in our service area. Uh, we are the largest municipal supplier of drinking water in the country, and we have four of the five largest treatment plants, water treatment plants in the nation. Uh, the way Southern California came about was uh, started over 100 years ago when 
we realized, uh, the small city of Los Angeles realized there wasn't enough water locally to meet its water supply needs, and William Mulholland went and built the Los Angeles Aqueduct to bring water to Southern California. As Southern California grew, it, it quickly outstripped the, that supply of water from the Owens Valley, and it formed the Metropolitan Water District of 13 cities along with LA to build the Colorado River Aqueduct and bring in water from the Colorado River. And then finally, as Southern California grew post the World War II, uh, we needed uh, another straw of water and we went to the Bay Delta in Northern California and we partnered with Governor Brown, the father of the current Jerry Brown, P Pat Brown, to build the State Water Project. Uh, at that time, it was the largest project in the world bringing more water greater distances to more people than anywhere else. Uh, but we realized in the 1990s that even with this amazing infrastructure bringing water in from far away, we still weren't reliable, we still were suffering in droughts and had to ration water. So we refocused our efforts locally and we focused on water conservation, water recycling programs, groundwater, and other types of projects that are drought proof in Southern California. And the Colorado River Aqueduct um, really is uh, is operated based on the conditions in California. It's the state project that's the big driver because it's so variable that the Colorado River supplies go up and down at the whim of the state project. And the state project has, it goes from droughts to floods so quickly. In 2014, we had, 2015, the lowest snowpack ever in the history of California. In fact, when they did the April 1 snow surveys up near Lake Tahoe, not only was there no snow, but it was green because it had been dry for so long. Uh, by far the lowest amount ever. Yet this year, we had the most ever. It was the wettest year ever in Northern California and the most snow ever in the Eastern Sierra. And these photos shown here were about April of uh, this year, uh, places near Mammoth Mountain had over 90 inches of water content of the snow. So eight feet of water up in that snowpack ready to melt. So huge changes in just a few years. And what this does is drive the price of water in California to huge swings. California has a, a viable and active water market where water's bought and sold among various agencies. And the average price of water is in the neighborhood of $300 an acre foot, plus or minus. It varies depending on where you are. But that average is only an average. It is highly variable. During the height of the drought, water was selling for $1,800 an acre foot if you could find it. Small amounts of water were for sale at incredible prices. This year, water was available for $18 an acre foot and there were no buyers. People turned back water at $18 an acre foot. So $100 an acre foot, 100, 100 times uh, swing in water prices, that drives what we do in California. That's nowhere in the Colorado Basin do you see swings like that. And that really drives many, much of our decisions and how we work in California. It would be like the price of gas averages, say, three or $4 a gallon but that it varies maybe a dollar. But what if the price of gas varied from 30 cents a gallon to $30 a gallon from year to year? That would dramatically change your behavior and, and that price of water dramatically changes our behavior in California. And also what it does is it really uh, affects our demand for Colorado River water. When in, in the drought years 2014, 2015, we essentially filled up our Colorado River Aqueduct as much as we could by buying water from farmers or doing interstate deals or other exchanges to fill it up and bring that water in. And this year we're looking at bringing only 200,000 acre feet into our service area because there's so much water within California. That's about a million acre foot difference in our demand for Colorado River water in just two years. You'll hear Arizona talk about there's a structural deficit in the lower basin that drives Lake Mead down. That structural deficit is, is about a million acre feet a year. Our demands are swing that much for Colorado River water. So it's, uh, we, we need tools in place to be able to do this. We couldn't always do this. Um, but because of the tools that we have, 
we, we can now do that. Now, California, this is a map of our partners in California along with Metropolitan Water District, the Coachella Valley Imperial Irrigation District, Palo Verde Irrigation District, and the Yuma Project all get water from the Colorado River. The ag agencies have the first right to the first 88% of California's 4.4 million acre foot apportionment, and Metropolitan has the remaining 12%. And in the middle of all of those agencies, you can see the Salton Sea. Salton Sea's had a dramatic impact on how water has been managed in California up to this point, and will have a dramatic impact on how it's managed going forward. And if you look at the geologic times of the Salton Sink area, the Colorado River used to empty into the ocean near where Yuma is today. That was the mouth of the Colorado River, and the ocean went all the way up to the Palm Springs or Indio Coachella area. But as uh, the silt came out of the Grand Canyon and formed uh, the delta, it separated the Imperial and Coachella Valleys from the ocean. So even though those areas were below sea level, they were separated from the ocean and, and the water dried up and it formed the salt and sink. And then when they, uh, farming started around 1900 in the Imperial Valley, they realized this was a great place to farm. Uh, it almost never rains, about two inches of rain a year, and they had abundant supply from the Colorado River. But at that time, the Colorado River was untamed. And in 1906, the Colorado River broke out of its irrigation channel and flowed uncontrollably through the Imperial Valley for 18 months into the formerly dry Salton Sink. And as it flowed, it created uh, a, the channel, this is the new river cutting its channel, and Mark Reisner in his book Cadillac Desert talks about this reverse waterfall marching up the Imperial Valley as it eroded uh, the valley from this huge flood flowing into the Salton Sink. Places where uh, uh, farmers would stand on the edge looking down tens of uh, feet down to the new river that was cut. And of course it flooded much of the lower part of the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea was formed uh, in 1906. Um, it's, it initially filled up pretty much, uh, pretty high level, and then it started to evaporate and shrink again once they controlled the dike. And then as they started irrigating in Imperial Valley, the agricultural drainage sustained the Salton Sea. And it, for much of the last century, was about as salty as the ocean. And so they stocked it with all kinds of ocean fish, corbina, tilapia. Uh, it was much, much like an ocean lake. And in the 1950s, it was reported that more people recreated at the Salton Sea than visited Yosemite National Park. And it also became an avian sanctuary. Huge numbers of birds, a variety of species of birds, flocked to the Salton Sea on its uh, Pacific Flyway route. And the, uh, some people argue, well, the Salton Sea is a man-made uh, artifact. Why is it so important to protect it for birds? But the problem is that a lot of these birds used to uh, reside at the coast. San Diego County coastline, there were lots of wetlands historically along the Southern California coast. Many of those were developed, filled in, and the habitat was lost. And as that habitat was lost, uh, the Salton Sea was formed and the birds migrated to the Salton Sea and, and found a new place uh, during much of the last century to, uh, to breed and thrive. And the Salton Sea itself is, is California's largest lake. It's, the scale is, is, is quite large, even though it's very shallow, averages is about 25 feet deep. It's 35 miles long and 15 miles wide, quite, quite an immense surface area out there. It evaporates about 1.3 million acre feet a year. Uh, its uh, temperatures often are in the 115s out there. In the shade, of course there is no shade. <laughs> now historically, uh, because the Salton Sea is at the bottom of a sink, Water that has a little bit of salt flows into it and pure water evaporates and as all natural terminal lakes do, they get saltier like Great Salt Lake and other lakes. But the Salton Sea was able to maintain its salinity about as salty as the ocean for much of the last century. 
This graph here shows the blue line is the elevation of the Salton Sea. You can see when it first filled in 1906 and then shrank back down again once they controlled it. But through much of the last century, it grew because IID was using more and more water. And as IID used increasing amounts of water, the flow into the Salton Sea increased and that offset the salinity increase. So as more water was, even though more salt was added to the sea, it got bigger and so the salt stayed more or less even from the 1920s to uh, just a few years ago, just about as salty as the ocean. But in recent years, uh, the sea has been shrinking and the salt is starting to go up and it soon will reach a turning point where the sea will shrink rapidly starting next year and the salt will skyrocket and most of the fish are already gone. There are some tilapia hanging on, but it's questionable about whether they're reproducing and it will soon turn hypersaline and the birds that rely on the fish uh, will no longer uh, be able to, to, uh, to have the same habitat there. So there's a lot of concern about uh, the future of the Salton Sea. The other big concern in that area has to do with dust. And Owens Lake is, was dried by the city of Los Angeles in the Owens Valley about 100 years ago. And it's become a major problem for the city because of the tremendous amount of dust that blows off the lake. Even though it's not a very populated area, uh, the Clean Air Act is routinely violated and the city of LA has to clean up Owens Lake and has spent a billion dollars so far and still the, still the lake violates the Clean Air Act. So there's concern about when the Salton Sea shrinks, there will be a shoreline that eventually will be about four miles long and wide in places. And that shoreline uh, will cause additional dust and it's a big concern for the residents down there about the future, their future, given the uncertainty of the Salton Sea. Now, uh, California, has uh, through the Boulder Canyon Project Act and the compact and various agreements, California has a basic apportionment of 4.4 million acre feet. And when I started back at Metropolitan were the good days in that we were getting extra water every year because the other states weren't using all of their water. We received an extra 700,000 acre feet above our basic apportionment for about 50 years. Two generations we had this extra supply that we knew someday we were gonna have to give up. We didn't know when that someday was, but we knew someday we were gonna have to give it up. And as Arizona and Nevada started to finally use all of their water by the end of the 1990s, Calif the, other, the six states were pointing at us and said, okay, it's time for you to develop a plan to reduce your use. So we developed a plan to uh, and, and this is a strange story of how the Salton Sea actually saved California. That, uh, it, th there are times when the Salton Sea saves California. So we, we developed a plan to reduce our use, uh, but we needed time to do that. We needed 16 years to reduce our use because nothing happens quickly. And so the other states said, okay, California, you'll have 16 years of surplus water available to you as long as we don't have a big drought on the Colorado River, you'll have 16 years of surplus, provided you increase your ag to urban transfers on a regular schedule with regular benchmarks. If you increase those transfers and take less surplus to fill your aqueduct, we'll let you do that for 16 years. And that was through the year 2016. So we agreed to that. We agreed to that condition. Uh, Arizona had another condition that they, they put on. Arizona said, well, in order for you to get surplus California, we need to forbear our rights. So we're gonna put an extra condition. We're gonna say that uh, you have to agree to the first million acre feet of shortages on the Colorado River. We don't know when shortages are occurring, but you, uh, because under the current rules, Arizona is the junior priority and is on the hook for shortages. But in this deal, they said, because you taking surplus might put us at risk, we want you to take the first million acre feet of shortages. And we also want you to sign this agreement, this water transfer agreement by December 31st, 2002. So you need to sign all of this transfer agreements and accept a million acre foot shortage um, in order for you to get surplus. So that was before my time, but we agreed to it. It was kind of a tough deal agreeing to a million acre feet of shortages, but we agreed to it. 
Uh, but this is where bad lawyering comes in from Arizona and where Arizona really regretted their bad lawyering. Because the agreement said, if you don't sign that agreement by December 31st, 2002, our whole forbearance agreement expires. And of course, as California was trying to negotiate our transfers, we missed that deadline. And it, it, we didn't sign the agreement until October of the following year. And Arizona said, okay, you don't get any surplus, but you still owe us the million acre feet. And we said, no, that's not what the agreement says. The agreement says everything expires, we're off the hook, and we don't owe you a million acre feet anymore. And Arizona said, no, that's not the intent. You were supposed to pay us the million acre feet. We said, but that's not what the agreement says. So uh, they were kicking themselves for bad lawyering, for not saying that regardless of whether surplus goes forward, you are on the hook for a million acre feet. So we got off the hook because we didn't sign that agreement. And why is it we didn't sign the agreement in time? It was because we couldn't decide responsibility for the Salton Sea. It took us an extra 10 months to figure out a plan for the Salton Sea when the state of California stepped in and said, we will be responsible for restoring the Salton Sea. So because of that delay, it really saved California and changed the landscape of the river completely. Had California been on the hook for a million acre feet of shortages, all of the negotiations and 2007 guidelines would have been different. All the way we up managed the rivers would have been different. But thanks to the Salton Sea and some bad lawyer in Arizona, we had a, a different path going forward. Uh, ultimately though, we, because of the drought did occur, we lost all that surplus anyway. And after 2002, we, there's been zero surplus and we had that hard landing. I remember waking up January 1st, 2003, and we lost 750,000 acre feet and we had to scramble. We were not really prepared for that quickly to lose that much water. We had to do a number of different things quickly uh, 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 to survive. Now, with, because uh, as I said, the agricultural entities have the first 88% 88 of California's 4.4, and the only way historically we were able to fill our aqueduct was our fifth priority, which is when California took more than its basic apportionment of 4.4. So quickly we had to focus locally and ramp up our local supplies. Uh, we have now 140 different water recycling projects that we helped fund with our member agencies in Southern California that produced 487,000 acre feet. That's about 12 to 15 percent of our demands met through recycled water. We also have groundwater recovery where we uh, uh, treat uh, salty groundwater or otherwise polluted water and make it potable so that we can use it in our service area. And last, a couple years ago, San Diego County developed the uh, largest desalination plant in the nation which produces about 52,000 acre feet a year. And there's some quick photos. And we also, to get through this recent drought, did a turf removal program where we paid $312 million to, re to remove uh, 164 million acre feet, square feet of turf. That's about six square miles of grass that we paid to remove. You can't go very far in Southern California without seeing that change. Many of my neighbors no longer have grass and as you go around you'll see the landscape looks different. It was a big investment in our part, but it, it's definitely changing in Southern California. And then we also then, after that agreement was signed, partnered with our agricultural partners to help uh, bring back some of our, recover some of our Colorado River supplies. We fund, actively fund, conservation measures within Imperial Irrigation District so they can grow the same crops with less water. Uh, the state paid to line the All-American and Coachella canals that used to lose about 100,000 acre feet of water that seeped through the sandy soils. Now that water is saved and, and transferred to Southern California. We have a program with Palo Verde Irrigation District, a rotational program where we pay farmers not to grow crops on a rotating basis. Up to a third of the land of the valley could be fouled at any one time or as low as about 8% depending on our water supply needs. And this shows how the, uh, the fallowing call has changed since the start in 2005. We've ramped it up to as high as 170,000 acre feet or as low as 32,000 based on our needs in Southern California. 
We also have a water sharing agreement with Nevada. Nevada's demands are down, so in dry years, Nevada can store water with us with an agreement that we will return the water to Nevada in a future year. Uh, Nevada's resource plan says they probably don't need the water back for a couple decades at the earliest. Their demands are, are quite, have been quite low. And then finally, a key program to us is storage in Lake Mead, known as the Intentionally Created Surplus Program, or as some say, Intentionally Confusing Situation. <laughs> but we can store water, since 2006, we've been able to store water in Lake Mead in wet years and take it out in dry years. And going into the drought in California, we had 580,000 acre feet of water in Lake Mead, and we pulled out a half a million acre feet to meet our needs in Southern California. And the reason that this is so important to us is because remember, water can range from $1,800 an acre foot in dry years to $18 in wet years. So if we can take some of that cheap water and put it in Lake Mead in a wet year and recover it in a dry year, that's a huge financial benefit. The ability to turn wet year water into dry year water with programs like Lake Mead, huge return on investment. And so in 2015, when there was no snow in California and very little supplies, we implemented all of our programs to help fill our Colorado River aqueduct. Historically, we filled it with unused water from Arizona and Nevada. That water was free water. Uh, or surplus water. That's what we got, free water for 50 years. But now we have to fill it by implementing an, all of our various pieces, our programs, our exchanges. This represents billions of dollars in long-term investments, whether it's lining canals, permanent infrastructure, uh, funding conservation in Mexico, other types of programs, billions of dollars, but it's reliable and it, and it helps us when we need the water, and when we don't need the water, we can turn a lot of these programs off. Now the problem, the one problem we have, however, we would like to keep doing this indefinitely. But the problem we have is that if the lower basin goes into shortage, many of these tools go away under existing rules. The ability to exchange water with Southern Nevada, the ability to store water in Lake Mead and, and recover it goes away and the ability to uh, fund conservation in Mexico and share in the benefits goes away. So what we are looking at, and the concern is that Lake Mead is very close to a first ever shortage. We uh, dipped below the shortage line last year, but only the end of the year elevation matters. So we haven't had a shortage, but we know it's coming, and we know that when it comes, uh, we're going to have a lot of restrictions applied to us even though we don't face the actual shortage. So we've been in discussions with the Drought Contingency Plan to uh, where California would agree to give up some water if Lake Mead gets down to elevation 1045. Nevada and Arizona also would give up extra water, but California would share in the cutbacks at low elevations that's a hard sell in California because we do have the highest priority right in the lower basin. But we would do that in exchange for flexibility to allow us to continue doing what we're currently doing in shortages. That is recover ICS bank water with Nevada and binational exchanges. But the two, uh, and I'm almost out of time so I'll go quickly, the two needs that we have in California, one is a salt and sea solution. So the salt and sea is getting at the critical point of the end of a 15-year period that the state agreed to back in 2002 to find a long-term solution to the sea. Uh, in the meantime, IID's been delivering Colorado River water directly into the Salton Sea. 800,000 acre feet of pure Colorado River water went into the sea over the last 15 years, and that ends this year. So the state did do a draft EIR in 2008, and this was the preferred alternative, this photo. Way too expensive, $9 billion with $100 million annual O&M costs. So the state didn't do anything. They have a draft order last week that they issued where the, now they're agreeing to a smaller C, finally, a more realistic C, as well as habitat milestones that occurs as the C starts to shrink, which will happen starting next year. The C will be very different forever. And that concept is the state will 
come as the sea recedes, go to the shoreline and try to uh, develop habitat that will help uh, the birds have a place to go at least on some habitat ponds and control the dust. But is that enough for IID to participate in a drought plan to save Lake Mead? Because if, if IID is key to helping Lake Mead uh, stay at a relatively high level or, or not go to a critically low level, but that's going to put even more pressure than we already have on the Salton Sea. And of course, in California, we need our own Bay Delta solution. Uh, we've seen additional risks in Northern California from subsidence, fishery decline, sea level rise, and seismic risk to the whole state water project that goes through the Delta. And historically, we've seen cuts because of regulatory requirements. In the 1980s, the state and federal projects used to divert an average of 8 million acre feet a year. But through all of these restrictions, now we're down to just over 4 million acre feet. And the thought is it's going to go even lower if we don't do anything. It's not reliable supply and also at risk of earthquakes and, and floods. So the solution is a tunnel that goes from northern Cal uh, north of the delta, under the delta, to the pumps that will not impact the fish like the current pumps do and also protect us from seismic risk and floods. And a tunnel boring machine would be used 150 feet underground, two 40 foot diameter tunnels. These are huge tunnels that would move water from north to the south. And, uh, and we're, uh, we're reaching a historic uh, point in that decision. That tunnel will cost $17 billion that will be funded completely by the ratepayers uh, of the state and federal projects. We are having, uh, we've had many workshops on that subject and it's time for us to finally vote. Uh, at our October board meeting, Metropolitan's board will vote and decide whether our share of that $17 billion is, is kind of questionable because it depends on exactly who's in there, but it could be 4 or $5 billion, $6 billion that we will have to fund in Southern California. We think it's worth it from the staff perspective, but there's a lot of public comment and debate about the, what, what happens. Um, so stay tuned and we'll see what happens in California this year, both on the two tunnels under the delta, and the Salton Sea. And as Ab Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to create the future, uh, to predict the future, is to create it yourself, rather than relying on judges or others to do that. So thank you for your time this morning. Bill says he has enough time that uh, if we have one question, we'll take the time for it. We have the resource here. Is there one question you'd like to ask? Mr. Hoskin. On your two tunnel system, will that be a statewide vote of the public? So it's not a statewide vote of the public because the public in general isn't paying for it. This is, it's a vote of the state and federal project contractors. So in 1982, it did go to a vote of the public and it voted it down. This time, it's the water agencies that will be making that decision. Thank you, Bill. I think uh, those of you who have been here before recognize that we always try, we always have, uh, a lower basin perspective offered at this conference. And I uh, really appreciate Bill zipping in for, uh, to be that resource this year. Very much appreciated.